Hi there, I'm Anna Dickinson. I'm a consultant in Odgers Banson uh, Central Government Practice. I am here today uh, recording our latest edition of our Switching Sectors series, and I am here with Simon Bohr, Chief Executive of Government Communications Service. Hi, Simon. Hi. Thank you for joining me today. My pleasure. So, let's start from the beginning. So, after nine years working for Heathrow, uh, you decided to join the civil service in 2015. Uh, can you start by giving me a high-level sort of overview of your career to date uh, in Heathrow and then obviously the roles you've undertaken in government? Yeah, so I was at Heathrow for nearly a decade. I did three roles there. I started off doing government relations and I'd done government relations in the private sector prior to joining Heathrow. Uh, and then I became a director responsible for internal comms and what was called customer complaints but became our digital <laughs> uh, communications practice uh, and then ended up as media and public relations head. Uh, and then uh, in 2015, I joined government. So I joined the Department for Transport, obviously, same sector, but very different uh, environment. Um, and I thought I would probably be in government for maybe three to five years and then go back to the private sector. But now I think I'm more than eight years in. I've worked in three departments, uh, the Home Office and the Department for Exiting the EU, uh, in addition to the uh, DFT. Uh, and then became Chief Executive of Government Comms in October of 2021. Super, thank you. And thinking back to 2015 and that decision to leave mm. Heathrow and join government, tell me what motivated you to make that leap? So I really liked the uh, variety and complexity of Heathrow. You'd got an enormous business, mm -hmm. but one with a really complex range of stakeholders. You know, you had airline customers, you had 200,000 passengers who were going through the airport every day, you had local communities, you had obviously a very strong political environment. So there was a mix of political, policy, regulatory, operational, crisis, comms element to it. And I was trying to find a job that had the sort of similar levels of kind of both pressure and variety. And uh, I was also, I, I felt that the job at Heathrow really mattered, you know, it was the UK's National Hub Airport, and I thought its success was important to the UK's future economic prospects. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was starting to have conversations with headhunters, and there was one in particular that I think was one of those moments where I realised that what I had thought was the right approach was not for me. So it was for um, a job for a coffee company, mm -hmm. um, and it was, you know, sort of vice president for Europe, Middle East and Africa for their corporate comms role and on paper it looked like all of the things you would want in a new job you know it was it was actually only 15 minutes away from where I live it was more money it was a bigger role um, but actually when I really thought about what the purpose of the role was ultimately it was really just about selling more cups of coffee sure. and I just had a moment where I thought when I look back on my career can I hand on heart say that was what I did with my life. Yeah. And so I tried to find a role that had got that sense of mission and purpose and value mm -hmm. that I thought would both keep me interested but also kind of serve a, a wider purpose. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. uh, and I knew someone who was working in government and they were like, yep, you should absolutely, you should absolutely join government. Great, great. And before you, before you joined the civil service, um, did you have any preconceptions about what it m might be like? Uh, and, and did anything surprise you? So. I, I had worked with quite a few civil servants in my government relations roles, but I suppose I had focused more on kind of parliament and the political side in my career than the civil service. If I'm totally honest, and I'm a bit ashamed to say this, I probably had a, a slightly negative view of mm -hmm. what the civil service would be like. I thought that maybe it would be a bit slow. I yeah. thought maybe it would be a bit old fashioned. Um, I wondered what the quality of the people would be like, to be frank. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I sort of say I'm ashamed to say because actually I was wrong about all of that. Um, the pace can be faster than anything that you would ever get in the private sector. You know, certainly if I think about my time at Dexu, where we had daily, you know, cabinet level meetings to yeah. prepare for the biggest constitutional change we were going to have in our history that was going to happen in six weeks time you know that the pace there is unlike anything that you would get but also most importantly the quality of people is 
is very much like in the private sector. There's some absolutely amazing, brilliant people. Okay. Um, and there's other people who you know, are not as strong performers. But I've, when I look back, every single organisation I've been in has mm. had that mix. And okay. it's certainly, certainly not the case that the quality is any lower in the public sector than the private sector. Mm. And I think sometimes the civil service can be a kind of easy political and media target. Uh, and um, because the civil service is not really in a position where it can, it has a public profile, you know, our yeah. public profile is predominantly through our political masters, I think it can sometimes mean that people have the wrong impression of what it's actually like being in the civil service. Sure. And what parts of your industry experience have translated well into government um, and been the most useful? And what perhaps hasn't? What have you mm. might have had to adapt? So I would, I'd say that the move I made earlier in my career from what was quite a small agency of about 25 to 30 people to going and working for BAA, which I guess would have been about 12,000 people at the mm -hmm. time, mm -hmm. I, I think that was a bigger cultural challenge than moving from Heathrow to government. Mm -hmm. So I think if, you are, if you're in the private sector, and particularly if you're in a regulated uh, industry yeah. or you're in one that's got a really high level of complex complex relationships yes. um, if you're you know if your role as so many big corporate roles are today are about tracking a path through policy changes regulatory mm -hmm. changes being able to understand how your business can be sustainable for the long term yeah. um, then that's, that's the same challenge we're dealing with in, in government. The complexity is of you know, another level again, but I think if you, if you like that and you thrive on that and you mm -hmm. like the sort of the challenge of being able to solve problems and work your way through that in a strategic way, then um, there's a lot that you'll like in, in government. And yeah. so I felt that Actually, I think if I had come from that small agency directly into government, yeah. I would have struggled. But yeah. coming from, you know, an organisation like Heathrow, BAA, as, mm -hmm. as, as was, uh, actually there was a lot that I recognised within here. Uh, and then there's bits of kind of understanding, you know, how the system works yeah. and where, yeah. the, where the sort of power and the energy and the ability to get things done really mm -hmm. is and where mm -hmm. the blockers are. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't say that's any more than kind of going into a big corporate and, and you, yeah. you know, you're having to learn that. Yeah, so that's the learning curve, you would say, is, is learning how the, the sort of machine works. I, I think so. I mean, particularly for me, because I was coming in having done not just the Heathrow role, but in private mm -hmm. sector roles I'd done before that, there'd been a transport focus. So yeah. I wasn't coming in having to learn a new, a new sector, but mm -hmm. I was coming in having to learn what it looked like uh, from the public side of the fence. Um, it's, I think it's more of a challenge if you're probably doing new sector and yeah. uh, coming into government for the first time, mm -hmm. but not impossible. People yeah. have done that successfully. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, what, in your experience, can the civil service learn from the commercial world and mm. vice versa in terms of best practice? Um, so when I first came into government, actually, I, I had looked at the government communication service because I when, when I was in the private sector I found some of actually the the policies and the practices and the standards in government communications mm -hmm. were better than anything oh, I had seen in the private sector mm -hmm. so if you look at things like um, our oasis model our kind of yeah. model for how you run campaigns you know focus on objectives audience strategy implementation scoring or you look at our evaluation framework I genuinely think some of the things that we are doing in government are world leading uh, and I think we've got some you know a number of projects and pilots at the moment on new innovation use of AI that again mm -hmm. are doing things that you know are can absolutely stand alongside the best of the private sector so I think the main area to be honest where we can learn from each other is I Having been in the private sector and come in, I'm a really big advocate for people within government spending part of their career in the private sector and vice versa. I don't think, you know, I don't think we're any more in an environment where this is, you know, this isn't a choice you have to make for mm -hmm. the whole of the rest of your sure. career. You don't have to be a civil servant for the next <laughs> 20 years if you join 
uh, GCS. But the, the biggest thing that I've seen on both sides of the fence is just a lack of understanding yeah. of the other's perspectives. And I, I think the more that you're able to put yourself in the shoes of people who are making decisions that affect you or people yeah. who are not understanding the, the reasons that you're trying to do something, yes. the better you'll be. And I, I've personally felt that after, what, 15 years of mm -hmm. advising private sector organisations on government relations, I learned more in my first six weeks about how government really works than yeah. in those 15 years beforehand. So I think, you know, I think business often, just at a very fundamental level, misunderstands mm -hmm. yeah. how government works and how politicians are making choices. Mm -hmm. And I would say that's exactly true the opposite way around as, yeah. as well. Yeah, interesting, interesting. Taking a slightly different direction now, um, as CEO of Government Communications Service and as a senior leader in the civil service, how do you remain focused on your key objectives and on delivery um, when you have the sort of broader political context and, and noise, I guess, you know, we've had, you know, political turmoil recently in recent months, um, perhaps, you know, negative press coverage of the mm. civil service. How, how do you stay, remain focused and motivate your team through, through those challenges? Well, I think, I mean, look, we are, we are here to serve the, you know, our political masters. And as those change, either as, you know, governments and prime ministers change or, you know, at election times where maybe different political parties come in, it is really important that we are able to both provide the highest quality advice to ministers and also mm -hmm. to be able to show them that we can deliver on their priorities. And I think often, you know, communications has got a really important role to play in driving those policy outcomes. Sure. So at one level, um, you know, the political noise is really important for us getting the direction around what ministers yeah. want us to do. And that, I think, you know, is fundamental to obviously our, our democratic system. At another level, I think as, you know, senior civil servant, you also have a kind of wider stewardship role. And yeah. in my case, I suppose, particularly elements of maintaining and building public trust in government communications and ensuring that we maintain the kind of highest ethical standards, as well as how we build up the the capability mm -hmm. uh, for uh, government communications for the future. So those are things that, you know, they don't really have a party political dimension to yeah. them. Whichever ministers are in power, they would want, I think, a government communication service that is working together and focused on the needs of citizens, that is uh, understanding how to drive the most efficient and effective use of public money when we do use mm -hmm. communications mm -hmm. as a tool and where people working within government communications have got the the skills that they need to, to provide great advice and to be able to deliver on ministers' wishes. So in some ways, I think, um, you know, what I have tried to do as the chief executive is because, you know, I'm, I'm operating in an environment where there are 7,000 people across government communications, mm -hmm. about 2,500 of those in central departments, about the other 5,000 across uh, wider arm's length bodies. Mm -hmm. And so in that environment, I suppose what I'm trying to do is send some strong signals about the clarity of what's important. And so we focused in our strategy on those three pillars, collaboration, innovation, and skills. Mm -hmm. And some of that is driven from the center. Some of it is about fostering the right culture and creating the right networks and frameworks to allow people to work together on those priorities and mm -hmm. so all of that I think is you know yeah. it's sort of one step removed from the political but sure. something that ministers absolutely want us to be able to to do. Yeah. No that's really interesting and that's something that we get asked a lot about you know um, that that uh, yes how, how you remain focused on the day job when there is you know that wider sort of um, political uh, environment to consider. Um, you, you've worked in government now for what, the past eight years um, and, you know, during some real sort of pivotal times for this country, you know, Brexit and the pandemic are the, the obvious things that spring to mind. Um, reflecting on your, your time in government, um, what, what um, you know, there must be times that you're the most proud of or um, what, what things do you think that, you know, there are moments in time that will stay with me, you know, forever? Uh, there are genuinely so many i mean that is the absolute pleasure of this job people often say like oh my god it must be like there's so much going on how do you do it but if you look you know in the, in the 18 months that i've been in this job 
we were at the tail end of COVID, but we hadn't had uh, the Omicron variant at that point. So the whole, you know, very early in this job, we were running the Get Boosted Now campaign. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that is just in a, a microcosm of what people across GCS are doing every day, a communications campaign that has an absolutely critical purpose, yeah. you know, avoiding a further lockdown, saving lives, preventing the spread of the virus by working out how can we, at a point at which people are really feeling, you know, fatigued by communications yeah. on coronavirus, how can we really persuade people to get that booster shot? And you could see within the space of, uh, well, less than a week, actually, that before the um, supply side had changed within the NHS, mm -hmm. just by uh, getting out and encouraging people to get that booster, we saw demand more than double. And oh, yes. so the, the, you know, the pride that you feel as a communicator of doing something that yeah. has such powerful impact mm -hmm. and such, is so important for the country as a whole. And so you know, that was the, 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 the first thing that kind of faced me within two weeks. And I'd got a team that was already you know, very well versed on how to turn mm -hmm. this stuff around quickly. But within the first 18 months, well, the first year, we, we had Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Yes. So, you know, how do you respond to that? How yeah. do you maintain a, you know, international alliance of support for Ukraine in mm -hmm. that environment? How do you make sure that people understand what's happening? How do you um, uh, respond to the disinformation that's coming yeah. out of Russia? You know, this stuff really matters. And then we had, you know, the Queen's funeral, another yes, very proud course. moment for GCS members and the way the government responded to that. But we had the cost of living crisis where yeah. it's, you start to look at, OK, well, what can communications do to get the support to the right people mm -hmm. and get them the help that they are entitled to? So, I mean, that's in 18 months. I could easily go back that's over like the whole I'm eight sure. years. But I do think, you know, the serious point for people is if you want a job that has got a real sense of purpose, mm -hmm. a real mission, if you... You know, if you do feel like, slightly facetious, but if you do feel like you're just selling cups of coffee, yeah. um, come and do it for a period. You know, you don't have yeah. to do it your whole career. You're only going to be more marketable, I think, in the private sector having got this experience, but your ability to really make a difference to people's lives and do yeah. some good yeah. is perhaps much greater than people might think when they, when they if they focus on the kind of political headlines and the... Uh, uh, and, the, and the sort of political to and fro rather mm -hmm. than the core of, of why we are trying to communicate yeah. uh, in government. Yeah, and, and I guess that leads me to my next question in terms of, you know, do you see your future career in the civil service or is your longer term plan to move back to the private sector? You know, look, looking at your time in, in the mm. civil service, you know, you could have done your couple of years in DFT yeah. and let back out again. You know, what, what's kept you here and what do you see for the future? So I think it is, you know, it is the challenge of, of the, the job. I, as I said, I thought I'd do three to five years. Um, uh, I've done just over eight. Um, I do think I'll go back to the private sector, though. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, you know, I'd, I'd like to do certainly through to the next election, and I'd like to support, you know, whichever government is successful at the next election and mm -hmm. deliver on the functional strategy we s set out. But I definitely see myself going back to yeah. the private sector. I, I think actually it is good to have change in mm -hmm. these senior roles. You know, I will bring a perspective, um, but inevitably I will have you know, areas that are underdeveloped or weaker than other people or areas that I just sort of have less interest in. So I feel that, you know, generally for chief executive roles, like five years is, is kind of the max. After yeah. that, I feel like you, you are, there are diminishing returns in the value that you are offering mm -hmm. the organisation. Yes, you have lots of experience, but it's probably time to take that experience and use it somewhere else and allow someone with some fresh and new ideas sure. to come in. So, yeah, I would love to go back to the private sector and I'll be excited about, about doing that when the time's right. Good, good. And the question that we always end on, what advice would you give someone who's considering a move into government? I mean, do it. Just, <laughs> just do it. it is, you absolutely will not regret it. They are difficult jobs. There are lots of different pressures on them. But if you thrive on a challenge, mm -hmm. if you want to do a job that really matters, and actually, if you want to be, if you want to work with brilliant people, um, then come and do it. And there's some real positives compared to the private sector. You know, when I was at Heathrow, 
you had relationships with your opposite numbers at other airports yeah. and airlines, but you couldn't sit in a room and actually share the challenges <laughs> together without breaking competition law. You, we do, you know, as directors of communications across the different government departments, we meet, you know, on a fortnightly basis. Mm -hmm. basis we share challenges, and there's this just brilliant, you know, it is the best network of professional communicators yeah. you you will ever join. Yeah, that is the beauty of the, of the yeah. profession structure, isn't it? That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Simon. That's been fascinating. Mm -hmm.